Hi, I'm Nancy McCammon Hansen. I am a Roost volunteer for AARP and I'm based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, we have with us today um, Javier Villamarzo, is the way I pronounce it, and uh, Marcus Vinson. And they are both with the driver safety uh, program that AARP promotes and sponsors. So I'm going to have each of these gentlemen uh, tell us a little bit about who they are and what their specific job entails. So Javier, let's start with you. Hi, Nancy. Thank you for having me on. Again, I'm, I'm Javier Villamarzo. I'm the communications manager here with driver safety, part of the driver safety staff here with AARP. Uh, and I, as the communications manager, I handle a lot of, uh, you know, any any exterior or any external communications for our programs and promoting our programs out in the public, uh, and especially communicating and working with our many uh, great volunteers like Marcus. And Marcus. Well, I am this. Well, thank you very much, Nancy. I'm glad to be here. I'm also uh, obviously an ARP volunteer, but I'm also the ARP driver safety state coordinator for all of the ARP driver safety courses that we hold here in Florida. We have a team of over 200 volunteers who are actually instructed to teach the course uh, to our residents here in the state of Florida. And I'm very happy to be here and glad to be a part of this conversation. Okay. Now I want to tell you both, the reason I volunteered to do this interview was because my father was a body shop foreman for oh. about 50 years or so. And then after he retired, he became an insurance adjuster because the insurance company came to him and said, you know how to take an estimate, we need you on our staff. So he, he didn't really wanna retire and he finally did at the age of 80. Um, but one time uh, he put a, a car in the showroom of the body shop that he was running for a Ford dealer. And this car had been in a head-on collision. So there was very little left from the wall between the, the engine and the, the front seat. And it was just, it was frightening how yeah. how mangled it was. And so I asked him, I think I was in junior high at the time, why did you do that? Because I thought, you know, this is this is kind of creepy. And he he said, everyone needs to know what a car looks like after it's been in a wreck. Got my attention. Um, put a lot of fear into me when he taught me how to drive, <laughs> but um, it it was a good visual because it is as amazing how a car just crumbles sometimes in, in the course of a wreck. So, but one of the things I wanted to ask both of you is why a driver safety program for people over 65? I mean, if you took driver's ed and you've been driving for over 50 years, why should you need to take another driver's program? Yeah, Nancy, and that, that's a great question. And we get that all the time. And, and you know, we get a lot of, of people who hear about our programs. Uh, they they are a little reluctant because they say, well, you know, I've been driving for all these years. But, you know, one of the things that we like to point out is that, you know, that reason alone is why you should take a refresher course, because if the last time you had any formal training was at driver's ed, and let's say you're 65 years old, there's many, many things that have changed since that time. So not just the vehicles, not, and, you know, the roadways have changed a lot. Traffic laws have changed substantially. You know, one of the facts that I like to, to point out is that if you're in your 60s today, chances are when you started driving at 16, airbags were not a standard feature in most vehicles. Uh, and then someone in their 70s, the Department of Transportation was not around when they started driving. So, you know, there, there's been many, many changes and, you know, a lot of our programs, including the Smart Driver course, we're, we're going to focus on today, uh, you know, is is made to help these drivers keep up with these changes. Because again, not just the vehicles, not just the traffic laws, not just the roads and the signage, but also our bodies change as we age as well. Yes, and I'm quite well aware of that having hit my 70s a year ago. Um, what, what um, are, are there any particular um, things that you have to do or be to be in this driver safety program or can anyone take it? Well, I'll take that one, Harvey. As far as our volunteers who teach our driver safety courses, they are just uh, volunteers here in the state of Florida who um, have no background necessarily in driver safety or anything like that, but they are people who want to do things in their community to, and they think driver safety is a good program because many of them are taking our course themselves. And they see the benefit of teaching this in their own community to other groups of folks about being a safer driver. And as Javier mentioned, all the aspects as we age, 
uh, do come into play. A lot of our volunteers are that same age and they understand uh, the need for themselves to keep their driving skills fresh. And they're very supportive of sharing with their community uh, this program to help other seniors as well be safer drivers. Now I say seniors, uh, there's not a specific number, but that age group is the kind of what we talk about in our classes. And again, uh, a lot of our volunteers, again, find it, the benefit to themselves as a refresh for themselves and for others. So is there a minimum age uh, to take this course or is it anybody who's an AARP member? Anyone who could take this course, whether they're AARP member or not, there is no oh. minimum age. You can still okay. take the course if you're a non-ARP member. Of course, we'd rather you would be, but if you're not, that's fine too. And okay. again, there's no minimum age. I've had uh, teenagers in my class as well as seniors. Well, that's interesting. That's very yeah, interesting. And, and to add to that, I, uh, the, the course is specifically designed for drivers 15 and older, but like Marcus said, it there's there's no age limit. We, we recommend anyone to take it. So what prompted AARP to develop this program? Well, it, it goes back to what, what we talked about, just all the changes uh, that people experience, uh, you know, just it, we like to use the term the transportation and the driving landscape. It changes so much. Uh, so we always want to use this course as a vehicle to, well, for, for no pun intended, uh, for a vehicle to help people keep up with those changes, you know, as the years progress, as, as the signs and the vehicles and our bodies change. And, and you know, just recently, we just launched in 2022, we just Every few years, we refresh the curriculum to meet with the times, to meet with the demands with all the changes. So in 2022, January 1st was when we uh, launched our latest edition of the Smart Driver course with uh, some really good updates. And, you know, previous versions of the course have won multiple awards just for the learning principles in them, the way that it's designed, that it's made, it's made specifically with adult learning principles so that you know, people can follow along. And one of the things I do like to point out, there is no uh, exams with the course as well. It's 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 not pass fail. It's just a, a course to to take in information. So there's no test involved. Uh, you know, you, you don't have to worry about that that aspect of it. Okay, good to good to know. Um, now, as I said, I've I was reached my seventies last year, and I have really noticed this year how my driving has changed. I used to have a pretty, uh, what my dad would call a lead foot. I drove a little too fast most of the time. <laughs> um, and I am just amazed. My husband and I were in Indianapolis this last weekend and coming back from, from Indy to Fort Wayne, which is a hour and a half drive or so. I could not believe the size of semi trucks on the interstate. I remember when semis couldn't even go on the interstate through Nebraska, my home state. Uh, and how fast people drive. Uh, we live just off of a, a major east-west route through Fort Wayne, and I, I call Jefferson Boulevard the Indy training ground because people are driving like they're training for the Indy 500. Um, so how, how much do your response times change as you age? Well, it's an interesting question in the way you pose it, Nancy. I can't give a specific number that says it, it increases or decreases by a particular percent, but I will tell you this. Our reaction times do slow down as we get older for obvious reasons. As we age, the reasoning and our, our, our thinking takes a little bit longer. Our memory sometimes takes a little bit longer. Our reaction time certainly takes a little bit longer in terms of driving, whether in the city traffic or on the interstate. So, yes, there is a difference in reaction time as we age, but it varies per person. Uh, we find that people who remain very active, who have good health, who may uh, drive uh, in certain areas, uh, maybe on the interstate or not, will have a different reaction time based on just the environment. Uh, and also their hearing, their sight, their, all those things are factors that will play into reaction time. We have a little exercise to do in our class where we kind of talk about this with, with people. And one example we use is on the interstate. We recommend a four second following distance on the interstate. That means that the car in front of you on the interstate going right. interstate speeds, you want to keep at least a four second gap between you and the vehicle in front of you to allow for you that reaction time. Should vehicles cut in front of you? Should the vehicle in front of you stop? Things that may occur that you weren't planning for, there are surprises that are because of our reaction time, you want to keep a safe following distance for that reason, but also applies in city streets. We want you to keep maybe uh, maybe a quarter mile gap between you and the vehicle in front of you, again, to allow for things that could occur as you're driving. So reaction time, we address that by giving our attendees tips 
on how to drive under those conditions to give you necessary space you might need to make an adjustment, make a change, to react to things that could dart out in front of your vehicle or things that could happen to you. So you're not caught off guard. You don't have to uh, react without plan kind of thinking ahead of time to be prepared. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, because I started wearing hearing aids about four years ago, and I don't wear them consistently because I'm right on the edge of, of needing them. And so around the house, sometimes I don't yeah. wear them. And I'll go out to my car with my hearing aids on and I'll crank the engine and the radio just about blasts me out of the back. because <laughs> um, I, I do enjoy the oldies stations and I do listen to the radio when I drive. Um, how much does your hearing affect your driving? Because you think vision, okay, but does no. it? Yes. Uh, uh, Javi, yeah, Javier, I'm going to take that one. Uh, there's a, a point yeah. we raised in our class quite a bit of time in our class. We talk about hearing because it's unfortunate. Fortunately, it's, it's something naturally happens to all of us as we get older. But hearing is important. And therefore, in the vehicle while you're driving, we suggest you keep the radio down. We suggest you minimize conversation in the car sometimes because it can be distracting for other things that are going on both in the car and outside the car. So inside the car, you want to be able to hear your engine. You want to hear anything is maybe in your vehicle itself that you want to be knowledgeable of that you're hearing kind of a noise or something that you want to be aware of. You want to hear if your turn signal is still on and should be clicked off. Outside the car, of course, you want to hear for emergency vehicles. You want to hear for other traffic around you. You want to hear from maybe motorcycles coming up beside you. Things that you may not see yet, but maybe you hear them. So hearing is absolutely critical as a driver to be aware. And that sense is important around you, both inside the car and outside the car. So you you really, if you, if, when you're driving, if you are, are, need to wear a hearing aid, we strongly encourage you to do so. And again, to uh, kind of keep that uh, that piece of information coming into you as you're driving, thinking about what you're hearing as well as seeing. And it, obviously vision is, is a- Very much. A big yes. thing. Um, I used to love to drive at night. I lived in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I would come home from work, sleep, and at about 11 o'clock at night, I would leave yes. alone down to Kearney, Nebraska, which is halfway through the state, overnight, no cell phone. I wouldn't do that now for, yeah. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't pay me enough to do that. And I have a hard <laughs> time driving around town at night. Yes. Street lights. Um, so I, vision is a really key thing, right? Absolutely. You and I both wear glasses, Nancy, I buy or bifocals and the stigma about being old wearing glasses. I think it's long gone. And uh, it's important to be able to see where, you, where you're driving both night and day, because there's so much information things that you read, not only the signs, but the road conditions, uh, things that uh, color difference as we age is important too, to be able to recognize, you know, lights and signage around us. So color difference sign in terms of distance back and forth. And as we age, things do occur like glaucoma, other diseases that affect the eyes and it could impair your driving. And we caution our participants to continually visit their doctors, their optometrists and others to make sure their eyes are tested regularly and they do get the proper adjustment to keep good eyesight uh, visibility while they're driving. Okay, well, and as a former optician, Marcus, I will tell you that glasses are also fashion. Ah, yes, they are. <laughs> Remember that, so. I will, thank you. Um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about um, driving tips and things about driving. Is there more traffic now than there was like 25, 30 years ago? So, so I'll I'll take that one and I'll, I'll let Marcus uh, I'll take the 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 first part of it and, and let Marcus dive into some details. But you know, anecdotally, we do hear that a lot, right? Uh, oh, I I feel like there's more traffic in my community. I feel like oh, I drove here ten years ago. I I, I can tell you my hometown where I grew up, Hialeah, Florida. Uh, I go back to I haven't lived there in in twelve years, and every time I go back to visit, the same streets that I used to drive to go to school and all that it's completely completely different now it's a bat traffic is backed up it's it it's crazy but again that's anecdotal but some some data does back that up uh you know the the demographics of of driving has changed a lot so uh, one of the the facts that i like to point out is that you know it, even in the last the last year that we have data right now is, is 2020 but between 2013 and 2020 and that's just five years or those uh seven years there uh, the overall driving population went from 212 uh, million drivers to 228 million drivers. And that's a, you know, tiny increase overall, 8%. But if we look at drivers 65 and older, 
that went from 37 million to 48 million. So that's an increase of nearly 30%. So, you know, one of the main, re one of the things why we do this program is because of the growing uh, number of o older drivers that, that are on the road, but a gro growing number of drivers in general. Absolutely agree. Everything Javier said, and we're here in Florida, Nancy, probably one of the states that the population here grows tremendously because a lot of people retire and come to Florida. So we are seeing a huge influx of people uh, into our state, which means more homes, more townhouses, more people here vacationing, more people here who are snowbirds who only here live here a couple of months here. So yes, as Javier said, communities are just popping up. More drivers are on the road and older drivers are on the road in our state, but other states as well. And so populations uh, in communities across the country uh, are seeing spikes because, you know, uh, people are buying homes and living longer. And uh, and the the old rural communities, the old uh, farm communities are kind of shrinking a little bit for more uh, homes, communities with a lot of housing, a lot of homes. And again, young families as well are popping up and, and living in communities. So that means more traffic, more roads and more changes because of driving behavior, because it's the population is shifting a little bit. So looking at um, like driving in a city or driving out in the country, driving on the interstate, where, where do most accidents happen these days? You, this might surprise you. City streets uh, are more traffic in the city than on the highway. And we have found that for seniors particularly, the areas that tend to pop up as some of the problem areas are right of way, uh, also making left-hand turns. Uh, and just city traffic itself has prompted probably more accidents for seniors are in city streets and in the highways. I have noticed um, we live not far from a, a major shopping center and um, running along one side of that shopping center are, are uh, streets that actually the shopping center owns. And rather than street or uh, traffic lights, they have four way stops. Yeah. And, and, you know, the way I was taught to drive with a four way stop doesn't doesn't seem to apply anymore. It's like who's got the guts to go first? Yes, um, it's it's kind of scary, really. It is. You never, you never really know yeah. how another driver is going to respond. And and we do spend a lot of time in our class talk about those situations. Not only four way stops, uh, but we talk about simple something you probably understand is how the roads are painted. Uh, what what is a passing zone? Not a passing zone. And what if there is no traffic lights? What if there's no traffic signs? Then what do you do? Uh, also, we get into traffic circles, roundabouts, which is something that's only been around for the last couple of years that have, have popped up a lot of communities and a lot of and a lot of shopping areas as well to keep traffic moving. But it does require people to understand what the rules are for driving, and and we all under, uh, apply those rules consistently. So yes, uh, we had talked about this in our class materials quite a bit about different uh, cities, uh, road designs, and what is the right of way and what is understood and what is the law because we cover that as well. I know um, when I was learning to drive, one of the things my father really pushed was do not park across the street from a driveway <laughs> <laughs> because they, they, they'd they fixed a lot of cars because yeah. of that. And, um, we have new neighbors across the street who park right across from our driveway. And we're also getting new water lines in our neighborhood. So there's all kinds of equipment running through now and it's an older neighborhood. So we don't have very wide streets. And it's, it's been really interesting to have to negotiate two-way traffic and things that look like tanks with big bubbles on them. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's going to be an interesting summer in <laughs> for us. Are there any times when you just point blank shouldn't drive, just stay home and don't get in your car and don't go out and drive? Other than uh, Javier, we could, uh, if you want to, I can talk about we need to talk program. Yeah, well, we we could go into just the 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 if you want, uh, Marcus, talk about a little bit of the self regulation that we we talk about in in the course itself. It yes. And, and, and we do spend time, Nancy, with our class participants because that time will come for all of us. And today's society, people are sometimes afraid of that. They feel a loss of independence. They feel a loss of, you know, just ability to get around when they can't drive anymore and with that re is reduced. So we talk about preparing for that future. It should occur. For some, it's different times of their life. So we do talk about in our class materials, preparation or planning, 
uh, because there are other ways to get around. People, there's more people walking, bicycling, golf carts. There's other ways to pick people around in communities now that maybe doesn't require a uh, owning a vehicle anymore. And simply the cost of owning a car is ex ex expensive as well. And for a lot of seniors who are on fixed incomes and are looking at their expenses, uh, to have a vehicle sit in a driveway for days or hours a day and not even get moved is like a waste of money a little bit. So we talk about in our class planning uh, some ideas to suggest some tips to maybe uh, reduce your driving if you don't need to. How about letting somebody else do the driving besides you? What a simple thing to do, carpooling with other people. Uh, so you're not doing the, doing the driving yourself. And as you said, Nancy, driving uh, during the day when you're much more comfortable, getting your, all of your activities done at the proper time of day when traffic is a little less in a row, we go through those examples. So we cover quite a bit, two of our chapters, about those adjustments that will you can plan, prepare for to make you feel as a safer driver and to be on the roads when you're safest time. And again, it uh, bus systems, other things are available, rideshare programs. There was no Uber around you know, years ago. Now you can call somebody up to take you someplace. You don't even have to drive yourself. So a lot of tips we give our participants in our class about uh, their driving um, options as they age. And so if you live in a community that's got public transportation, but it, yes. could, but it could be better. Yes. Um, the thing you need to do is go out and try try to make it better. Yes, good yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah, and 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 to add to that, Nancy, too, like you know, we we have a section that focuses on, uh, on medication as well, and you know, e even something as simple as, hey, if you don't feel good today because you know the medication didn't sit right with you, you know, don't don't drive that day. So so li little things like that to look out for. Like it's okay to if you don't if you don't feel, or if you don't feel like driving, just period. You're you don't you're not up for it. Don't 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 drive. Don't force yourself to do it if you don't have to. So a lot of those like self-managing, self-regulation tips. Okay. Now I have a question for you, and I know you can't um, tell us specifically what kind of car you should be driving, uh, <laughs> make, make and model, which is fine because we all have our, our different favorites. But I learned to drive on a 1963 Cadillac, which had the fins out the back and was about the size of a small boat. Uh, and I wouldn't drive a car that big now to save my soul because for one thing, I don't think I could park it. <laughs> I had a, a coworker one time remark that she, she watched me parallel park my, my 2002 Ford Focus and she was really impressed. And I said, well, a Ford Focus is, is little enough that you can do that. Um, uh -huh. A 63 Cadillac, no, I wouldn't even attempt it. So <laughs> if, if you're out looking for a different car, which I bought a different car a couple of years ago after having had my Focus for 19 years, what kinds of things should you be looking for if you're gonna trade cars? change cars. And this is a question I didn't tell you in advance. I was going to have thought about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll take a bit and, and Marcus, you get out onto it as well. Uh, but, you know, especially if you're, you're in the market for a, a vehicle, one thing to keep in mind is all the new safety features that are in vehicles right now. Uh, a lot of them are, they're designed to keep you safe, but we've heard from uh, many people that, you know, Oh, these things, this this car is dinging too much. Oh, the car is doesn't let me. Uh, it's it's a correcting me to move the steering wheel. So there's all these new safety features that are popping out, and they're all great. But uh, one of the things we do recommend is uh, getting educated on those safety features so that you can use them to your advantage because they will keep you safe. Uh, we do have a, you know shameless plug to one of our newest programs, Smart Driver Tech, that is a, a you know free workshop that teaches you about uh, these uh, safety technologies that are designed to keep you safe, but may be a little overwhelming for, for people at first, especially if you're not used to it. So one thing to keep in mind is that, just uh, what safety features are you looking for? You want a car that's comfortable, you want a car that fits you well. Uh, I'll give a, a plug to one of our other programs, CarFit, uh, where you know it, there's typically events, it, we have in-person events where you take your car and they do a whole check where they run through and make sure that you are comfortable in your car, because it's not just about safety. It's about sometimes when you're comfortable in your car, you are also safe in your car. So you want to keep those things in mind. Are there safety features that you're going to know how to use them? And are you going to be comfortable in your car and know, you know, be comfortable and be safe in there? We don't want people needing uh, to sit on some books to be able to reach over <laughs> the, look over the steering wheel 
or, you know, be really, really close to the steering wheel uh, when that's that's unsafe. So there, those are little things to, to look into. And it's it's mainly about what you're comfortable with. So it, it could whether it's a small car like a Ford Focus, some people like SUVs, uh, some people be more comfortable in an SUV. So, you know, recommending more so what you're comfortable with. And Marcus, if there's anything you want to add. Well, no, you, you touched on the, the absolute key points. And the only thing I would add to this, if you're looking for a vehicle, a comfort level is certainly important. Uh, being able to visually see out the, all of the vehicle, to, to see your, out the windshield, the side, the mirrors are very important. So not only good safety features is fine, but also, again, just your ability to drive that vehicle. A vehicle too big, <laughs> but like you said, Nancy, is probably not wise for some people. And a vehicle too small may also be a challenge for some people. So having the right vehicle that you feel safe in, that has equipment that you can operate, as, as Javier mentioned, that that it fits the kind of driving you're going to do, whether it's going to be on an interstate or city, parking, as you described, Nancy. Uh, a lot of people count on these backup cameras now on these new vehicles. Well, we certainly encourage you still to look over your shoulder when you're back out of a parking spot. And just uh, it's a good habit to continue doing that, even though the safety feature is there. We want you to actually, so as a senior, that sometimes could be a challenge physically, but we encourage you to take proper steps to drive the vehicle safely in the right conditions. Now, of course, we're in Florida, we don't have ice and snow, so, but imagine your state where there may be icy roads and snow and oh, so yeah. forth. Driving in those conditions may also dictate what kind of vehicle you drive and the equipment that's on that vehicle as well. So it's it's a combination of things. We go over in our class with participants and you have them think that through so they make a, a good decision. Okay. Now, I would assume that if you take the driver safety program, um, there are some benefits with your car insurance. Would you like to elaborate on that? Yes, most states uh, offer a discount uh, for taking a safe driving course. So we certainly promote the ARP driver safety courses, you know, the best. Uh, how much that discount is, is going to vary uh, per person, per state. Uh, as to what that limit is, uh, what that amount will be, if at all, it's it's up to the st uh, insurance companies to dictate information to our to their participants. So we tell our our people in our class contact your insurance company to get that information. We we cannot give you specific amounts of discount because okay. we don't know your background, your what you kind of vehicles you drive, how many miles you drive, uh, driving records, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, uh, yeah. Can you add to that. Yeah, I was just going to add the same thing. Like, come before you take the course, uh, recommend uh, consulting with your insurance agent for any details on potential insurance discounts because they do vary by state and and by driving by driver as well. Okay. So, gentlemen, anything else you'd like to add that we haven't covered already in this conversation? Well, Nancy, we did talk a lot. We our, our today's focus was mainly on, on the Smart Driver course, which is our flagship program. And I do want to say it is available online uh, as well as in person. And it's instructed by our many, many, many great volunteers. It's available nationwide. Uh, but you could there's many other programs that we have that I want to promote as well. And you could uh, find them by visiting our website at aarp.org slash drive. I touched on a little bit about Smart Driver Tech, which uh, talks about uh, vehicle safety technologies and the, the most modern vehicle safety technologies. Uh, but I also do want to uh, promote our newest and first ever app, which is called AARP Safe Trip. It's available for download now at uh, any uh, app store, whether you have an iPhone or an Android device. Uh, and it's, you know, it's some, some of you may be familiar with it. You may have a similar app from your insurance company. But the great thing about this app is that, you know, it helps you monitor your safe driving behaviors. It can show you where you can use some improvement. And the best thing about it is that it does not share information with your insurance company if you don't want to, you know, have your insurance company have that information. Uh, and then great thing about it, if you're an AARP member, you can invite other members to join and you could have a little competition, see who's the better driver among your fellow AARP member friends. So it, uh, if for that app, you could find it at aarp.org slash safe trip. Okay, that sounds, that's wonderful. I'm going to try that. <laughs> yeah, we just launched in December and uh, it, it's been going great so far. I have everyone, I, I've been using it. I have everyone in my family using it. Uh, and I know a lot of our, our volunteers who helped us develop it uh, because they did a lot of our volunteers did all the testing and, and you know, brought a lot of suggestions uh, that are rolled in and, you know, we're constantly updating and it uses concepts from our programs to help drivers 
uh, you know, improve if they need it. Some drivers are 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 great already. So it looks at uh, a bunch of different aspects of driving, including phone usage, which is obviously going up. I don't know how many times I drive nowadays and I see people on their phone while they're driving and it's it, it'll ding you. The app is really good. It'll ding you for that. So <laughs> I highly recommend people to check it out. That's good. That's good. When I see people on their phones and they're they're driving particularly fast, it just <laughs> scares me. Yeah. So, anything else you'd like to add, either one of you? Well, I guess the only thing I would add is certainly is we would welcome other people here in my state and certainly in your state as well. And that's who want to become ARP volunteers in the driver safety program. We're always looking for more volunteers to, in their in our communities to work with our seniors and other groups to help promote safe driving. It benefits all of us when people on the road are safer drivers of all ages. So I certainly encourage anyone who uh, be interested in becoming a volunteer and teaching this program. It's it's a good program, uh, a lot of benefits for themselves and for their community members. Yes, we're always okay. looking for volunteers nationwide. And we will all keep that in mind. So I thank you both. This has been a really good conversation. I appreciate it, you made my day. Yeah, thank um, you for the time. I'm Nancy Hansen. I'm a uh, AARP Roost volunteer and uh, we are signing off now and we appreciate your watching. Thank you.